Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll profile an artist, Terry uh, Gelsing, uh, with a North Dakota Council on the Arts uh, profile. But first, joining us now is Scott Davis, the commissioner of the North Dakota Indian Affairs Commission. Scott, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. As we get started, tell the folks a little bit about your yourself and your background, where you're originally from. Sure. I'm um, a proud member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, uh, enrolled member there on my mother's side, and also a descendant of the Turtle Mountain of Banna Chippewa on my father's side. And uh, But pretty much grew up on and off the uh, the reservations throughout my life and uh, finally settled here in uh, in Mandan. So uh, raising a family and and working hard. Mm -hmm. Well, now, how did you get to be so, the Indian Affairs Commissioner? Well, uh, seven years ago, it's 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 went by fast. Uh, uh, back then, I was working as a development officer at the United Tribes Technical College here in town, and uh, got a got a very nice call from the governor's staff back then, and uh, interested in uh, being the, the next uh, commissioner for Indian Affairs. And uh, so, uh, luckily, uh, he appointed me, and uh, been doing that ever since. So, seven years the. Uh, transition talk about in terms of uh, being the head of the uh, Indian Affairs Commission. Yeah, it, it it really entails a lot. You know, it's it's uh, strictly, you know, the uh, the um, process of being a statesman, a, a negotiator between our state and the tribes, being the liaison uh, for the governor when it comes to education systems, court systems, um, you know, healthcare, uh, taxation, uh, oil and energy. So it, quasi, it covers a, a wide array of issues that, uh, that we face together as a state and a tribe, and it's my job to make those things work that benefit each side. Well, with that said, uh, you know, cause, uh, obviously from a uh, Native American side, it's a sovereign nation yep. and dealing with uh, government, the United yep. States. So how, how do you uh, juggle that? Right, right. Well, federal law, you know, constitution um, says that our tribes are all all tribal nations, you know, by that constitution. So sovereignty is, is a big, big word that is not used lightly in terms of our relationship with the state. So again, our state, you know, uh, is sovereign, and I'm all for that. Uh, tribes feel the same way. And so again, you have sometimes uh, three uh, rules, sets of rules that we must all play by, state, federal, and tribal. And again, it's it's my job to navigate through those, through those laws and through that jurisdiction and to make sure that um, Everybody's somewhat happy with the, with each side, and uh, and ultimately uh, benefit uh, everybody that w that lives on and off the reservation. So it's a uh, it's a challenging job uh, at times, but it's very very uh, full of op opportunity. Uh, but it's one I really really enjoy. Okay. Well, with that said, let, one of the things uh, we wanted to talk about today was a newly established mm -hmm. uh, Native American Hall of Honor. Can uh, uh, you tell us, it's, it's going to be housed at the Heritage Center yeah. in Bismarck, I understand. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's an exciting part of uh, my job, probably six years of my seven years uh, uh, in my tenure. Um, you know, back then we were, we were building the, the newly Heritage Center back then, the bricks and mortar of it, and obviously raising a lot of money and so forth. And back then uh, we looked at the blueprint of, of the, uh, the actual blueprint of the, of the facility and there was a, a nice large space, a hall, <laughs> if you will, uh, located right, 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 right in there. And so we went through the process of making sure uh, some of our galleries, uh, making sure that those galleries were right as far as uh, the uh, the stories and the ex uh, the expeditions that were um, the exhibits uh, that were uh, that were created, and all those exhibits and uh, the stories all came from our reservations. We we did a, a very good job of, of doing that. And now comes in the Hall of Hall of Honor, and of course, uh, um, your common U.S. citizen or the Christian look at this as a Hall of Fame. Well, in our in our terms, we don't have words for fame, and so, but we do have uh, traditional words for uh, for honor. So that's where the uh, the North Dakota uh, Native American Hall of Honor came from, and so now we're right in the midst of it. Uh, our application process deadline was this last week, you know. And so uh, May 2nd, and uh, right now we have 13 applicants in, and uh, it's pretty exciting uh, what those applica applicants, uh, what the applicants are saying and how they're, how they're crafted. So really looking forward to uh, getting into, into more of that. What, you said 13 applicants, so mm -hmm. w what was the nominating process? Yeah, yeah, well, there's four categories, you know, uh, first of all. Uh, first is leadership. Again, that's very, very, very broad. It could be elected leadership. It could be a person on council or or trouble chair, or it could be your your servant leader, your community leader, your elder, your um, your grassroots leader. 
Uh, secondly, we have the culture and arts. You know, as many of us know, in, in, in North Dakota, we have um, very, very world, world known uh, artisans and poets, writers like Louise Erdick, who, who is a uh, Rough Rider recipient. Uh, and also we have champion power dancers and, and singers in, in our state too, so those will be profiled as well. Third, we have uh, military veterans. Um, as, uh, as we all know, uh, military veterans are held in high regard and as, as they should be. So again, those are open to that as well. And also um, sports and athletics will be our fourth category. Your, your teams, your individual uh, uh, sports um, champions and uh, state champions, national champions, all Americans, and, um, and so those are really the four categories. And um, we we cap it at eight at eight um, inductees uh, for budget reasons and for time reasons and so forth. So so right now, uh, soon in a couple of weeks, our committee will be will be going through that whole selection process of um, of the applicants of the thirteen applicants and. There could be eight. There could be two. There could be one. You know, it's a, it's a, it's going to be a interesting process in, in a, in a very, uh, I think, a difficult process. But I think it, but difficult in the terms of, uh, of a good process, uh, because I think uh, uh, we all agree that uh, there's got to be a bar to make it in. You know, just because you were such and such, doesn't give you a, a um, you know, a immediate pass to the Hall of Honor. Uh, so there's going to be a lot, lot to look into on these applicants. Well, you mentioned you would cap it at eight, mm -hmm. but it, it, is it you got the four categories? Are you looking for at least one in each category or anything, or does it does it really matter? Well, I think on a on a perfect on a perfect uh, inductee, it'd be two per per okay. uh, per um, per mm -hmm. uh, category. But it's going to take time because this this hall of hall of honor is going to be different than others in regards to you know you have your basic plaque, you know your picture and, and the name. Well, this is going to be more virtual, more um, contemporary. It's a touchscreen, so it's going to require a film crew to go out and capture the story of Grandpa John Doe. You know, his story as 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 a family would want. You know, what he did in his earlier life, what he did as a as a young man, as a young lady, and maybe into his uh, late, later on his career. So some of these may be uh, in memoriam. You know, may be deceased. Some may be uh, living today. So. So again, it's going to be a virtual, uh, a reel where you could just touch the screen, and out pops the uh, the, the the movie. Mm. <laughs> so it's going to be exciting. Yeah. Well, so you talked about it, and you you're deciding. But so the first batch of nominees will be decided very soon. But then, what's the timeline for for getting the hall set up? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, if you go in there right now, the, the screens are set up. Uh, we have a nice, huge, um, I guess, a window sticker of the logo itself, which is a, you know, a very, very tall logo. And that took some time to get in there. Uh, we have uh, next to the, uh, the kiosk, the touchscreen, we have a large um, uh, glass case. So our hopes is that uh, if Grandpa John or Grandma Jane make it, they will donate something that uh, resembles them personally. It could be their military helmet. It could be their, their, their war bonnet, their wapa. It could be... Um, you know something that depicts uh, them of, of um, that would be on loan for a year or two. So, so again, that's those are, those are things that are going to be uh, that are already there right now. The infrastructure is already there. So it's just a matter of you doing all the paperwork, selection process, and uh, getting these um, getting them selected. But uh, the um, uh, the first uh, inductee class will be uh, this September, right here in Bismarck, and uh, so we'll have everything ready to go, and the whole ceremony will take place. Uh, uh, during the um, uh, United Tribes uh, Leadership Summit Powell here, right here in Bismarck. So annually, will the process be the same, no nominations in the spring? Yes, yes, be the same year after year. Okay. Well, what about the funding? Uh, you talked about funding a little bit. So how did the funding come about and getting all this established? Yeah, well, kudos to to the foundation down there and, and the leadership down there with the, the, the society. They've done a, a, a tremendous work of raising money you know, whether it's private donors, company donors, energy, uh, you know, just people that want to give, um, you know, anonymously, you know, they, they've done an excellent job of, of raising a lot of funds for, for the hall. So, and that's continuous, you know. Believe me, I've, I've still pitched this, uh, this great opportunity to a lot of folks out there. And so a lot of people are mulling over it and hopefully will we'll contribute here in the, in the near future to the, to the Hall of Honor. Okay. Well, you mentioned uh, you taught at uh, United Tribes mm -hmm. in Bismarck. Can you ta tell the folks a little bit about some of the programs and opportunities that United 
uh, Tribes offers students? Sure. Well, United Tribes does a tremendous job in of educating students and providing degrees and programs, certificates, but uh, all of our other tribes do the same thing as well, just a little differently, and uh, providing education degrees. They're credited, you know, same way they're credited just like NDSU and UND and so forth. So that degree can take you anywhere. But a lot of the programs that are offered, uh, in particular with the United Tribes, I think uh, the big one that I, I think of is the nursing program. You know, we need nurses. The teacher ed program, we need teachers. Mm -hmm. The other one is business. You know, we all need business leaders and we need uh, people in business and uh, people to work for business. And then you have the other technical ones too that are welding, truck drivers, uh, carpentry, auto mechanics, you know, all geared towards providing jobs and, uh, and uh, growing the economy, not only on the reservation, but off the reservation too. So United Tribes and all the other tribal colleges uh, in, our, in our reservations do a tremendous job of educating our people and uh, you know think about the energy um, that's there uh, not just your 18 to 24 year old student you're talking about a family you're talking about you know some older generations that uh, want to go back and finish their degree or get a certificate or maybe move on to a master's degree or doctor degree so so we're definitely doing that and uh, we're going to continue to do that and um, probably the last big one I see is the workforce development model that we've used here with the United Tribes in partnership with the Department of Commerce. You know, again, training people for maybe it's the energy sector, maybe it's back home, maybe it's, again, but workforce development programs on our tribal colleges is really key, and we need to con continue to keep funding that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of the key issues, um, you know, that are impacting Native Americans uh, in North Dakota? Well, they resonate same with, you know, North Dakota as well. You know, when you talk about jobs, education, Poverty, you know, uh, those things have always been a challenge of, of, of tribes. Um, you know, getting a good job on the reservation can be challenging at times um, because um, maybe sometimes a lot of tribes don't have private sector uh, businesses on there. That's one thing I've really been pushing for through my uh, found, founding of the North Dakota Indian Business Alliance is, uh, and again, a partnership with the Department of Commerce and other entities um, is to create more private sector businesses on reservations, you know, and so again, that leads to a better economy, jobs, growth, and um, and again, uh, building a, maybe a hopefully a better tax base on the on the reservations as well is key to pay for those services that are highly needed by uh, by our tribes as well, tribal members as well. So, has has the legalized running of casinos on the reservations uh, helped with in terms of jobs? Good question. You know, one that is very very important. You know, we just passed our, our, our uh, gaming compact here a few years back. You know, that was a good thing. And making it more longer term, more sustainable. Um, but it really, the, the, the biggest and most strongest reason why casinos were created in our state on reservations is for jobs. It, it, it creates jobs. My brother works at a casino. It provides a job for him, his family. It contributes to the economy, the community, so forth. So, so... You know, this, sometimes this thing about creating a uh, casino off the reservation, I've, I've always been opposed to it and always will be. Uh, I like them where they're at. They should remain a, as such. And, uh, and they provide good things. Uh, none of our tribal members get a dividend or a, or a per cap uh, from the casinos. All those, those uh, revenues that come from those casinos go back to funding education departments, uh, elderly programs, veterans, uh, infrastructure, roads, and so forth, too. So... So all those funds go right back to the to the tribe, and, and that's a very very good thing. Are some uh, reservations doing better economically, or? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, the Fort Berthel tribe, the MHA Nation up there, is doing well because of where they're at location, right in the heart heart of the Bakken, you know. So they're doing very very well as a tribe, but also um, individual allotments, you know, royalty payments and so forth. Families, uh, you know, lucky enough to to, to get those payments as well, but. Uh, you know, yeah. So, so they're obviously doing, doing, doing well. But uh, the other tribes are 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 doing just as well as well. I mean, as far as um, the people, the businesses, the opportunities, uh, working hard. I know every tribal leader um, right now is working very, very hard on all those issues that we're talking about here, and trying to provide a uh, provide a better um, opportunity for for the tribal members back home. Yeah. Well, so you you say the the oil industry impacted it. Uh, of course, is it following uh, the the cost of a barrel of oil and everything? So are they seeing a dip right now? Oh, absolutely. You know, our state is going through that. Commodity prices are are 
are um, there. It is what it is, you know. So the tribes have have uh, been uh, been uh, forced to cut back on their budget, their spending, their resources that they can provide to their tribal members too. So, so they're definitely feeling the, the same pinch as we are. Mm -hmm. How many people uh, work in your office? I have four. I have four people: admin assistant, uh, my education administrator, and my healthcare administrator too. So. We're, we're very busy, you know, very busy and have our hands in a lot of things, a lot of calls that uh, provide uh, guidance and leadership uh, through our office too. So we're very, very key to the, uh, to the well-being of our state and our tribes. Mm -hmm. Well, can you tell me about some of the success stories of Native Americans in North Dakota? Sure. Yeah, I think the, the biggest one I could see right now that's, um, is uh, Danielle Finn here who lives here in town. She has recently, recently crowned... Uh, Miss Indian World, you know, basically, you know, Miss America uh, on the Indian side. So uh, I know her family pretty well, and uh, she comes from a very, very strong, educated family. And, uh, you know, for her to go through this uh, this um, campaign, if you will, uh, required a lot of leadership. And I think she's a law student now down in uh, New Mexico, Arizona, so she's well on her way. Um, other success stories, you know, I could think of NDSU, the Masters of Public Health program up there, uh, first of its kind in the nation, uh, which uh, U NDSU has, has uh, created a uh, Masters of Public Health on tribal reservations through uh, uh, addressing tribal issues. So public health in, um, you know, on, uh, through tribal health is another uh, master's program and maybe even a doctorate program here that is happening right now and uh, hopefully will be, become a doctorate program at NDSU too. So we're so looking forward to that. Uh, the tribal colleges, as I explained, uh, also on the business side, North Dakota Indian Business Alliance, um, in our Indian education programs too, we have a very, very strong uh, North Dakota Indian Education Advisory Committee too as well that we work very closely with DPI and the tribal college education systems too. So, so again, those are things we've been working on. You know, uh, legislatively, we have the Tribal State Relations Committee, bipartisan, uh, both sides, House and Senate Committee uh, that, that uh, you know, goes through the, the legislative process. So, so they're, they're again another opportunity. And lastly, the other success we, we've, uh, we've championed over the years was the uh, Tribal State Court Affairs Committee. Again, Supreme Court justices, tribal court uh, justices, talking about jurisdiction, talking about law, and uh, really working together. So those are some really good things that we've, we're, we're doing, and I think we are, the, we are the, the leader when it comes to tribal state relations compared to other states in our country. Hmm. Scott, real quick, I mean, do you set goals for your office or do you just take on issues as they arise? Yeah, you know, a lot of these things are, are goal-oriented. You know, the issues uh, come, and, come and go, but uh, projects, I'll say, I've been working for four years are happening. So it, it takes time, and it's a delicate process of not to force my greatest idea on anybody, but uh, it's always uh, things that need to consider on how to do things better, how to work work. Uh, uh, work through it uh, betterly th uh, through through negotiation, and without compromising anybody, anybody's sovereignty or jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Well, finally, if more, people want more information, where can they go? Who can they contact? Sure, website's pretty easy. You know, www.nd.indianaffairscommission.com. Uh, the Facebook is the same, and uh, call my office three two eight two four three two. And my office is right at the Capitol. And I encourage anybody to stop by, have a cup of coffee, and uh, come visit. Scott, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. At 10 feet high and comprised of roughly 2,000 paper mache bricks, Spirit Wall is a collaborative art project between rugby North Dakota artist Terry Jelsing and members of the Spirit Lake Nation at Fort Totten. Within each brick of the wall are the hopes, dreams, memories, songs, and drawings of the people who created them. When I've got colored paper, I can kind of drape it over the sides like that. I add a little bit more, and I start to fill up the mold. Do it. Go ahead. Tip it upside down, lift up, pinch it, drop it. Very good. I think the connection between art and life for uh, people on the reservation is less distinguishable than it is maybe for the white cultures that, that surround it.
We often think of art as a commodity and I think that from ancient times forward people in indigenous communities have thought about art uh, simply as an exercise in everyday life. The North Dakota Museum of Art received a grant to host a collaboration project between people of the Spirit Lake Nation and at least six artists. I was fortunate to be one of them. And so the wall itself is like the community, but the brick is like the individual, like all of you are individuals. So when you take all of these bricks, which are like all of you, and you put them in a wall, it's a pretty strong wall, wouldn't you say? Yeah. When I started to think about the reservation and what the reservation uh, meant, I thought of the wall as a metaphor that really sums up for me the idea of, of how uh, we perceive the reservation. We perceiving meaning the culture that is not a part of that. And so I wanted to get on the inside and find a way or a process in which the people of Spirit Lake could show some of their work as being part of that. The spirit bricks are bricks that was an increment that many people could make. I encourage them to write prayers, stories, names of people, uh, memories of people, draw pictures from the very young to the very old, and they would tear this paper up and put it into the paper vats that I had before the bricks were actually cast. I think for folks who have participated in the project to see their bricks become part of a stronger whole is something that I wanted to accomplish um, as an artist. And so my part in it is really an arranger, um, a designer of processes, a way of bringing people together. When I think about the bricks themselves, we're looking at right around 2,000 efforts, 2,000 people being involved in, in what this is about. Brick making's a hard job, but somebody's got to do it. All of these bricks are made of different things. There's lawnmower grass mixed in with them. Those are the kind of the browner ones because they're organic surfaces. There's uh, papers that were generated on the reservation. I think every secretary between Rugby and Devil's Lake has been saving paper for me for over a year. There's uh, deer hair in them. There's probably some blood in them from hunting season. So all of these bricks get ritualized with the time of our life. Even though I'm using non-traditional materials, it, it does sort of work like traditional bricklaying materials. This is what a bricklayer would probably call backfilling. This stuff sets up fairly quickly, so I don't have a whole lot of time to deal with it. So I pre-planned where the bricks are gonna go. And the first thing I do is just simply lay them up and get the surface kind of connected on all sides. Because they're relatively the same width, they're not always the same height. And so the kind of odd shape, it's uh, kind of responding to each one separately as you're putting them together because they're different. Okay, once I have that part of it done, I have to shim these because if you notice, they all tend to fall down. And I'm simply using just different pieces of foam core, different types of foam core paper. And I'll get these up to a certain level. The material is relatively strong when these bricks dry completely. They're almost like solid pieces of plywood. And so um, if you think of the weight of this as being, you know, the end grain of telephone books piled up on top of another, you can imagine how, how heavy these sections are. Probably 75% of the bricks have been made by people on the Spirit Lake Nation. So the idea of collaboration is to extend out as far into the uh, community as possible and try to get as many par people to participate. I taught at Rugby High School for several years. The welding instructor, Bruce Ganarelli, has been doing some wonderful things with kids there and uh, wanted to give them a chance to be collaborators too. What we designed is a bracket system uh, to go on each side of the wall and then bolt all the way through it. It's good that kids get to do these different types of projects, but also a project like this that reaches out beyond the community and into the state. 
The North Dakota Museum of Art has been a great leader in the state of North Dakota and has certainly promoted projects like this that create opportunities in rural areas. And I think the benefit is yet to be realized in terms of, of how social art projects can affect the culture of North Dakota as well as what we think about art in our lives as individuals. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding provided by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.